the first stretch of opens in uh, for Star City this year are pretty East Coast and Midwest biased. Mm -hmm. They're in Orlando, in Columbus, Baltimore. I believe uh, there's one in Tennessee early in February. Yeah, Nashville. And one in New Jersey. So uh, it's very easy for Chris to make a push here, attending all the events. There's not really anything going out on the West Coast or in Texas or anything like that until later on in the season. And all it takes is one, really one good finish, and these events start – it starts becoming very easy to rationalize going to all these events because, again, Chris is making a push to play in the Players' Championship later this year. All these points add up, and he can give himself a, a really big early advantage by just showing up to everything, playing, and doing well in a couple of them. And, you know, it, he does have the uh, the benefit of some players maybe not traveling as much as he does uh, to make this push. Now, the person who's in second place on our leaderboard right now, um, Brian Ronwin, well, he top eight this weekend. Yes. So he is chasing uh, William Huey Jensen right now for the number one spot uh, on the leaderboard. And Brian is well on his way here. If I recall correctly, I believe Trey has a Grand Prix win, Trey Van Cleef, a Grand Prix win many years ago in Old Extended with three deuce. I may, ah. this may be an internet worthy search here, but Showing if I recall, your it could age. Be, we could be talking like well over 10 years ago, yeah. if I recall correctly, but uh, I could be confusing him with someone else. Pretty impressive, the, the, just the knowledge, Bing, yeah. that you have. See, Van Cleef on the right, 7-2-1, and Mono Blue Devotion. Van Meter sitting at 7-3 and three with Green, Red, and Monsters. Again, these three players are going to be able to make top eight. I'm unsure if they'll be able to make top 16 or top 32. Uh, you know, again, there's a, there's a ton of people here, so you don't know how things are going to break for these guys as far as, you know, the finish goes and cash, stuff like that. But playing for the Open Series points right now is certainly important. And we do want to give you guys at least one good match to see before we did wrap up the day. So hopefully it will be that. You see Chris with the soul. Trey is known for a very ponderous pace of play. So uh, what you're seeing right now is not uh, – it's not the exception to the rule, certainly. Sure. Looks like he's going to mulligan again, so it looks like he'll be starting off with five cards this go around. And Trey's another player that it wouldn't surprise me again, given the location of the early uh, opens and his, you know, resurgence onto the scene. Another player I wouldn't be surprised uh, to see at many more events in the near future. Now, right now, taking a look at the Star City uh, Player Championship leaderboard, Brian Brund, uh, Huey Jensen, I'll start there, 152 points. Brian Brundwin, 127 points. If you, uh, if, if Brian, excuse me, is able to get a win here, that's 20 more Open Series points. Mm -hmm. It was up to 147. That puts him in really, really close striking distance of Jensen. Um, you know, it, it really is really interesting because, you know, to see how this is going to go through Season 1, who's able to kind of take over the leaderboard and all that good stuff. Yep. And, you know, if Jensen's not willing to travel these events early on, then Brian can make a push and uh, easily get himself in the first place if he's attending all the events. Yeah. Of course. Wow, you got it right. I was right. Three deuce at Grand Prix Philly. Do you know why the deck was nicknamed three deuce? Now, I used to know the answer to this question. Um, God. No. Because you regularly put Ranker on Dwarven Minor, so you made a 3-2. That's where the name came from. Wow. <laughs> Okay, that is maybe not the answer I heard. That's awful. Yeah. It's a great deck name, though. Yeah. I will say that. I think 3 Deuce is one of like, the best deck names ever. Because you made a 3-2. Yep. With two cards and three mana, you could make Dwarven a... Dwarven Minor blows up a non-basic? Yeah, it's Stone Rain to non-basic. Yeah, okay. It's like, oh, yeah, it's like Dwarven Blast Miner. That's where that card came from. Right. It's the actual card that doesn't have more. Okay. Correct. So here comes six cards for Trey. Two... Three, four, five, six. That's just his first mulligan of the match. I do want to correct myself there as Chris is going to play a Mutavolt and pass the turn back. There is a Cloud from Raptor for Van Cleve. Can get back over this way. You can see Chris does have a stop and ground in his hand, actually two of them, so he does have access to green mana, but in case he didn't want to fire up the old Mutavolt on turn two, he was going to have access to do that. It was somewhat curious that he wouldn't play a ground there, but I guess there is some percentage chance that this turn two is just attacking. Yeah. Maybe throw his opponent off the scent for a little while. And there is a scavenging ooze before Van Meter has passed the turn back. So Van Cleef's going to untap that island. He'll take a draw step here, see if he can evolve the Raptor. You do see a Frostburn in his hand, so it looks like we're going to have a 1-2 Raptor on the second turn. Pretty solid mulligan to six. Yeah, can't complain. He might have another one drop in his hand that he wants to deploy first. We'll see. Yeah, these guys tap two. 
He's going to go with a Tide Binder Mage to shut down the Ooze and evolve the Raptor and come across for one. And you see the evolve there. And in for one. So Vamir is going to go down to 19 here. And it's, uh, his scavenging Ooze is not going to be doing a much attacking or blocking moving forward. Going to have to get that Tide Binder Mage off the table first. But luckily for Vanmeter, he drew another copy of scavenging Ooze. So no problem. Pass the turn back. But we've seen, you know, the green-red monster deck so far be a little soft to flyers in some of the matches we've seen. Yep. So uh, this is a really good start for Trey. Here's another evolution of the Cloudfin Raptor via Frostburn Weird. Across, it will come the flyer, attacking for two in the air. Van Reader with no blocks, of course, going to knock Chris down to 17. And passing the turn back. So Van Reader will take a draw Andrew step here. Trout. He's going to find an Elvish Andrew Mystic. If you see Chris Tanner now, he's got a Gorkland Rampager. Uh, he's got that Mystic, a Xenagos hanging out over there. So he's certainly got some things to do on this turn. He just needs to figure out how he wants to navigate this game. Uh, I think this seems like a reasonable spot to try to land Xenagos. Uh, he does need to overload motors at some point, so the mana potentially matters. Um, and there's not a ton else to do that's, that's hugely productive this turn. Stomping around again, the stomping around, the Xenagos, the Elvish Mystic, the uh, the Dragon, and the Gore Clan Rampage are the five cards that Vanmeter is looking at here. Yeah, there there is, of course, the issue of the Raptor potentially evolving into a 3-4 and just taking care of Xenagos. Mm -hmm. So ideally, Chris would like to get a bit more of a sealed board, but with no answer to the Flyer uh, in hand. I'm going to play this on tap, so it feels like Xenagos is going to come down. Maybe he's going to risk it. So Xenagos is going to come into play. He's going to tick that up to four. And now he's going to be able to deploy the elf and just pass the turn back with the drag. So basically, what happens here is if Trey's not able to kill the Xenagos this turn, um, it's a huge turn for Chris because he's going to have he's going to be able to generate a ton of mana, and basically get all the stuff out of his hand and kind of go crazy with the dragon and things mm -hmm. like that. If you're Chris, the card you're trying to fade right now is Master of Waves, but you see in Van Cleve's hand that he has one currently. Yes. So that's what you're looking to dodge, and unfortunately for Chris, he is unable to do that. Assuming that Trey wants to deploy that this turn because he doesn't actually have to. He can play Frostburn Weird this turn and then make a bigger Master of Waves the following turn if he'd like. Landing Master here with Chris already under the gun seems uh, pretty attractive to me. The additional two tokens here doesn't feel like that meaningful because it's Chris has to either kill Master or it's bust. It's yeah. But it looks like uh, Trey also has an incentive to try to evolve his Raptor one more time, and so he's going to hold off firing off that Master Waves one more turn. Yeah, he wants to make it as big as he possibly can. Also has the opportunity to attack with the Frost Marine, and I think what that's going to force is uh, Elvis to probably go on chump blocking duty, depending on where he does send the creatures, of course. I think it's likely that he's going after Xenagos here, and he has to be concerned about mortars getting overloaded, so the mana ability on Xenagos is uh, potentially something some that, that Trey's quite worried about. Yeah, mortar overload here is the big issue for Trey, uh, because it's going to clear everything up. See, Trey's going to take a look at Xenagos and all the abilities of that card. So we will do the same here. Of course, we're going to generate a ton of red and green mana with the plus one ability, 2-2 two -two Seder of the zero ability. And the ultimate doesn't come up a ton. Um, I know Chris has said that he has used it in the past, but oftentimes he's just putting Seders into play and generating uh, mana for monstrosity. Yeah, the board has to be empty for so many turns for you to be able to go ultimate with Xenagos. And in that world, you're often better off just making two twos every turn. Yeah. So it's pretty corner case for the ultimate to come up. Vanmeter is going to put the scavenging ooze in the front of the frostburn weird, saying he values the uh, he values the elvish mystic very very highly. Yep. Uh, and the second ooze is not really adding a ton to his board. Yeah. So Zenigus is going to go down to one. Frostmore is going to finish off the scavenging ooze with one activation. And Vanmeter is going to quickly untap and draw here. So, of course, he's looking for Mizium Mortars if he can find one. He draws a Boon Seder for the turn. Not the best draw in the world. And again, you do see his hand of Storm Death Dragon, Boon Seder, and Gore Clan Rampager. So he's going to be able to deploy some things here, which is good for him. 
Um, and the Dunegos is going to be able to add two mana, so two plus the Mystic is three, four, five, six. Have access to seven mana. I guess he could just play. He could play Rampager and Boontator, or he could just play Dragon. Doesn't seem like the best turn, honestly. Yeah, it, it's a little short of being able to do multiple awesome things with with his mana this turn. Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me if he actually just ends up making a two-two here. Concedes that he's going to lose the Zenigos in combat next turn, and uh, just add to his board that way. Yeah. The start is going to be a Boon Seder. I guess he can add, now he can add a, a Tog. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah, he can do this and play a dragon. Right. Okay. Miss that interaction here. Boon Seder effectively costing two mana. Right. We should be on the ball with that stuff because Nykthos does some of the same stuff yeah, sometimes, but yeah. haven't seen it through Xenagos yet. All right, so three mana. Four and five tray, making sure he knows exactly how everything works there with Zenigos. You do see now everything is kosher, and Van Meter is going to pass the turn back to Van Cleve, who again has Master of Waves and Island in his hand, is going to take a draw step here. And that's a Cloudman Raptor. So again, he needs to decide how he wants to kind of navigate this turn. He can play a Cloudman Raptor and a Master, but then his Frost Mortars won't be able to spin uh, and try to kill some things because he won't have the necessary mana to do that. But does he want to attack first? If so, with what and where? Yeah, attacking is a pretty rough proposition this turn. I think that if I'm in trace spot, I just say, all right, well, I need to dodge mortars for one turn, play my raptor and play my master, mm -hmm. and then next turn almost certainly kill Chris if he doesn't find Mizzy and mortars. Starts by playing an island. Because last turn was so such a juicy spot for Chris to mortars if he could. It seems safe to assume that it's not in his hand. Yeah, it seems, like the, it seems like the easiest turn is just playing Raptor into Master and I getting two Evolve Triggers. I also don't know what, I guess I also don't know what Trey's hand, I don't think Trey's hand allows him to take a different path of action. Sure. And plus, I mean, the other thing too is he's just going to get so much, he's going to get so many tokens that it forces Chris's hand on drawing more of Pelucranos right away. Or he's basically dead. Trey again rereading. Something that's obviously smart to do. You want to make sure you know that the ca how the cards work. You don't want to assume that you that you know how Xenagos works and you're wrong about that. So now there's the Raptor, there's the, and then there's the Master of Waves. Two triggers. He's going to get two, four. He's going to get two, four, six. Nine tokens. Seven, eight, appears. nine tokens, yeah. Let's see if we're equipped with that many. Oh, we are. Oh! Are we short one? No way. Yep, we're short one. Bummer. What a bummer. All right, well, nine tokens are going to come in. There's your double evolution of the Cloudfront Raptor. One from Master coming to play. Second from the Elemental. That's a 2-1 when it comes into play. So there's a 3-4. Excuse me. Yeah, there's a 3-4 Cloudfront Raptor and a 2-3. And I've assumed Trey's not going to attack and just yeah. cross his fingers for one turn. Pelucranos or Mortars. What's it going to be for Van Meter? Chris takes a draw. It is a stomping ground. So, is there so anything he can do to get back into this? He, you know, he he does have some life that he can gain with the scavenging use, but he's going to be attacked by nine two-power creatures. You can see yeah. if he puts the four cre three creatures, oh, I guess four with the satyr. Kind of mutable. So he might not be dead next turn. Could be wrong about that, but he might not. Well, be he has dead. four blockers. To so five tokens come through at minimum. Yeah, I, I think he's he's well. Uh, so his best blocks are on the three four Cloudfin Raptor and the two Frostburn Weirds, I guess. That's what it looks like. Which leaves three eight. It's, it's like pretty far past lethal, I think, if he doesn't do anything else. Three, four, five. Yeah. I think I'm with you on that one. It's going to be a hard game for Chris to win. He's got a, he's got a Rampager. He's got Scavenging News that I think he can gain at least one life with. You see, he's going to take a look at his sideboard here. Uh, he's going to, excuse me, grab a Seder token out of his sideboard. And he's going to cast Gorkland Rampager. He's got a green man available via the Mystic. 
to be able to activate scavenger news, just pass the turn back. So it's basically saying, all right, if you can kill me, kill me. Yep. We're all face up here. Chris has the ability again to gain one life off of that ooze. And Trey has no cards in his hand, so mystery card here. So Chris has access to plus one life, which puts him at 16, and five blockers. Biggest block, again, all, all we do when we count the math here is we just count him blocking the biggest creatures, which would be Frostburn Weird, Frostburn Weird, the 3-4 Cloudfin Raptor, and then two tokens. So that means it's 7 into his 14, 15, 16 from the other Cloudfin Raptor, 17, 18 from the Master, 19, 20 from, yeah, the, uh, from the Tidebinder Mage. Yeah, so I think, it's, uh, I think it's safe to just turn everyone sideways here if you're Van Cleave. We'll see if he sees that attack, though. Trey checking and rechecking here. So, one, two, three, four. Yeah, I think an alpha strike is, is safely a lethal attack here from Trey. Better safe than sorry. That's what I say. Yep. And there's the concession. So Trey quickly up the game. Again, on the black, uh, back of Claflin Raptor, we've seen this a couple times now out of the red-green monster deck. Uh, fast Claflin Raptor is not, not a lot of outs. We're looking at basically Mizium orders. The Storm Breath Dragon has kind of been out. Uh, yeah, a couple so other. Kind of, sort of. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Dombri plus X, but uh, this is not the first game we've seen kind of go down in similar fashion. Take a look at the sideboards here. We'll start with Van Meters as he's going to be on the play. I've got one Rurik Thar, four Mist Cutter Hydra, two Destructive Revelry, two Shock, two Plummet, two Mizium Motors, two Chandra Pirate Masters. Of course, if you guys do want to find out more about Chris's deck, of course, go to our coverage page where we have done a deck tech with him. Brian Brundwin also played in the exact same 75 into the top eight here. Um, but four Mist Cutter Hydras are the easy ones to board in. Um, two copies of Shocker, perfectly fine, taking care of Tidebinder Mages, and there are other targets here. Two copies of Plummet. Eh, I mean, they do take care. They do have some targets. I don't know if they have the best of targets here. Two more additional copies of Mizium Mortars. Well, we just saw in that last game that uh, Chris really wanted to draw a single Mizium Mortars to get back in that game, so I can imagine that he'd want to add the last two. And then the two Chandras, I don't think he's going to want in this matchup. So he's definitely got some options. Miss Cutter Hydra, the best of them. Yeah. Trey has a single copy of Curse of the Swine, uh, which I think is probably excellent in this matchup. Uh, he has a Dispel, doesn't really want here. A Jace, I would be surprised if he wanted here, as Chris's creatures are so large. Three copies, he's a domestication in a lot of plays. A Biden, uh, the game feels a little bit more about what's happening on the board and not trying to outcard him. A Negate, it, it wouldn't stun me to see a Negate come in as it covers against Mizium Mortars, uh, but it is a little bit narrow. Chris's deck, obviously, majority creatures. Three Dissolves feel a little cumbersome, and four copies of Gain say not really appropriate here. So besides Curse of the Swine, it wouldn't really surprise me to see Trey really touch nothing in his sideboard, uh, although I think there's an argument for a little bit of extra permission coming in as well. Of course, if you guys are just joining us, Cedric Phillips, Patrick Sullivan, last round of the day here in Indianapolis, Star City Games Open Series, first stop of the year. We're winding down on the day, as we do see Trey Van Cleve is up a game here against Chris Van Meter at SCG Live, hashtag SCG Indy for your tweets for the rest of this evening and all day tomorrow. This is the last round of the day. Of course, we'll be doing our quarterfinals, our semifinals, and our finals tomorrow. So that's what we do when we have an 11-round tournament. We don't want to be stuck here all evening when everything's closed down besides the old steak and shake, mm -hmm. which I would go visit anyway. Yeah, obviously, obviously just going to snap that off. I would love a steak and a shake. Yeah, they um, serve both. They, they do have both. They have both. They are nutritious um, and delicious. Yeah, among other things. Yeah, so um, make sure that you guys do join us tomorrow morning, bright and early at 8 a.m. Again, we have basically got our top eight locked here so what we're going to do at the conclusion of this match is uh, we'll do a brief wrap up come back tomorrow morning do our bracket breakdown for you guys of the eight players the seeds the archetypes our predictions all of that stuff quarterfinals we'll play we'll give away three months of premium semifinals six months of premium finals the full year again this matchup here only has open series points implications as we do have our top eight locked here among the people in the top eight raymond perez Owen Turtenwald, Brian Brondwin, and Andrew Shrout. I believe there might be a couple of ducats on the line as well. Perhaps a uh, fifty or hundred bucks. Yes, if yes. I'm not mistaken. A, uh, a a bone or two. Yeah, on the line. That's what the cool kids say. Uh, uh, bones or clams or whatever it is you people call them. Yeah, you. Be <laughs> Big Lebowski. Any no takers? All right, whatever. I haven't seen the movie enough. Okay. <laughs> I I will admit, I will openly admit that. I, I have seen it a, a decent amount in college. Um, the only line I really ever quote from that movie is, the bums always lose. Yeah. So, obviously the movie's great, though. 
Uh, yeah, I, I regularly quote quite a few lines out of that yeah, As you should. The Bums lose is high on the list. Yeah, the Bums always lose, Sullivan. They always lose. So it looks like both players finishing shuffling up here before we do start the second game here in this matchup. Van Cleave, of course, on Mono Blue Devotion. One game one via Master of Waves. Van Meter, Green Red Monsters, a deck that Brian Brondwin did take to the top eight. Both players playing the exact same 75. Can't find that deck tech on our coverage page. Probably run it again tomorrow for you guys as well as a lot of people have been asking about this deck. Van Meter also did win a super IQ with this a couple weeks ago, and he wrote an article about it on Star City Games on Wednesday. So if you want to find out more information about that, you can certainly head over there and hear it from the master himself. I suspect after watching this green red monster deck on camera all day that the mono blue devotion matchup is actually not particularly good. Um, now that said, uh, the the red green monster deck has uh, certainly some tools and. Mono Blue Devotion is one of the decks with the highest skill cap in the format. I think you can definitely tell the difference between skilled pilots and less skilled pilots. Uh, but uh, it feels like Cloudfin Raptor plus the other tempo stuff that's going on here is a pretty tough recipe for Red Green at least game one. I definitely agree with you. I, I, and I, it feels like this matchup would probably be good for Chris. Uh, Polyphronos is insane in this matchup. Uh, and I think that he has plenty of good tools. I just don't think that he really... It's easy to say he drew the wrong half of his deck, but I mean, like, his draw was a draw that I think he would want in a particular matchups. So I think he just didn't want it in that one. I think part of the problem is I, I feel like the red-green deck is conceding too much of the early game uh, where the blue deck is able to get out on top uh, pretty fast. And Clef and Raptor with backed up by Tidebinder Mage and Frostborn Weird are just uh, the red-green deck gets on the back foot and there's not all the time in the world to deploy additional threat uh, to, to recover from the, the hole that you dig yourself in early on. Yeah, and that makes sense. That makes sense. Van Meter looks like he's going to send it back. We'll see if Van Cleve wants to do the same. I don't know if you feel that way about the skill cap part of, of Mono Blue, but that's definitely been my experience. I don't think I agree on the skill cap part. Uh, but it's more skill intense than I think than people think. I, I was just playing a lot of Red White Burn online, winning comfortably over half of my matches against Mono Blue Devotion, feeling like this matchup's really sweet. Ran into Sam Party. He mulliganed to four and easily crushed me. <laughs> Just, game wasn't actually even really that close. So that caused me to reevaluate my take on how good that matchup actually Would was. Would you say it was party time? For one of us. Sam and I trade jabs at each other when we see each other at tournaments. I always say it's party time. He calls me Cedric the Entertainer. Okay. And we just decide every time we do it, we're like, why do we do this to each other? We both hate this so much. Yeah, and neither is particularly clever. No. That's the other thing about uh, that's this. The that's the reason that we do it. His, but na his name is, like, phonetically just Party, so yes. that's the joke. And your name is Cedric, so I guess that's the joke. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, we're pretty dry here, I feel yeah. like. We're real innovators. You can give that one up. You, I feel like you can give that joke up. He started it. Well, that's, I mean, I guess, sure, but that's not. He didn't have to call me Cedric the Entertainer. I wouldn't call him Party Time if he didn't start it. All right. And in fairness, I think he calls himself party time. So. On occasion. On occasion. Van we're Meter happy enough with his six, I think? We're yeah, not here to assign blame, but <laughs> it's his fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna start for the no tap stopping routes and an Elvish Mystic. So Chris has a pretty solid hand here. It looks like another land, a shock, a boon Sater, and a Plurukano. So uh, a good recipe. He has something to fend off the early pressure and one of his power cards in Plurukano's. Another Elvis Mystic here for Van Meter, so he can actually work his way up to that Pelucranos. Temple of Abandon off of the top. Take a look at Immutavolt there. Leave it on top. And I think you're safe to attack with the Mystic and play the other one, probably. Not 100% sure about it, because there's a chance that he might want to just leave up the Shock. So that if the Time Under Mage comes into play. Yeah, that's what I think he's going to do. Pass oh, the he's turn casting back. the elf. Yeah, he's just gonna pass. He's gonna cast the elf and leave the shock up for a tide binder mage. And I, I kind of like this play because not only does it kill the mage, but it also slows down devotion. Now, if it's frostburn weird, it's not as good, and that's exactly what it ends up being. But at the same time, Chris doesn't really care very much about a frostburn mage. You're, you're giving up one point of damage to to ensure that you get to get this line. So this seems worth it to me. Uh, and there is a Pelucranos. I'm gonna pass the turn back. So Van Cleve gonna tap the two islands, start his turn with the frostburn weird, and take a draw step. He finds a copy of Thassa but he's immediately underneath the gun. And you can see exactly how good Van Meter's deck is when he has mana acceleration as opposed to when he doesn't. Yes. It's night and day. 
Yeah, it's, it's a lot of the, a lot of parallels can be drawn by watching the Mono Blue Devotion deck, where it doesn't ha when it ha doesn't have as early setup as low impact as those cards can be. Mm -hmm. Just spending its mana and building up devotion is a valuable thing to do, almost no matter what the the permanents say on them. And uh, when the Mono Blue Devotion deck goes one drop, two drop, versus the games it doesn't, you can really tell tell the difference. And the mana creature draws are very similar here. So Thos is going to come into play. I mean, Cleve feels the need to actually get this set up here. Uh, so it's kind of like taking a turn off, but not really, because it probably is going to turn into a 5-5 five -five next turn. Yeah, he gets, to, he gets to recoup this tempo at somewhere else down the line, and playing the Night Veil vale Spectre is opening your, yourself up to all sorts of really bad turns. Yeah. So uh, I like this approach. It, it looks a little rough this turn, but I think it's going to pay dividends in subsequent turns for Trey. Let's see, Van Meter has, still has a shock in his hand, so I think an attack with the old uh, little Mutavolt is kind of appetizing here. He might want to. He might want to suit up the Pelucranos this turn. You can also suit up an elf too. Make it so that he has two relevant threats. Yeah. Not move all in on Pelucranos. Makes yeah. for definitely an interesting decision. Yeah, I kind of like yep. this. Diversify his, his portfolio a little bit. Yeah, I mean it, it's like a pretty clear attack if you're informed of the format that hey I have Boon Seder or I have Gore Clan Rampager, <laughs> so you should just take this one damage. But at the same time, I mean. You can catch a birdie. He also just might be casting Boon Seder this turn regardless. Yes. So if Trey wants to block with the weird, that's awesome. And if not, well, it didn't cost you anything. Yeah, and you still get to push through a whole bunch of damage and put Trey on the back foot in a big way. That's exactly what's going to happen. So Boon Seder is going to be bestowed upon that Elvish Mystic. That's a 10 ball. That is a 10 ball. No big deal. That's just 10. Mm -hmm. Puts you to 9. Monsters is appropriate for the name of this deck. As Van Cleve's going to untap, he'll start by scrying with his god consult his hand as he looks at the card and we'll see where it goes. So what are the cards that Trey's looking for right now? I guess Rapid Hybridization and Curse of the Swine are high on the list? I would say those are the highest on the list. Uh, of course, I mean, Cyclonic Rift is like okay. Sure. Uh, it's not exciting, but it's not bad. He's going to put the top card on the bottom and take a draw here. Draws another copy of Thassa. It's just fine, but yeah, I think it's those two cards that you did mention. And again, Rapid Hybridization isn't great either. Yeah, it's just it's okay. Fine. It's yeah. just okay. Curse of the Swine is probably the best of the bunch, and again, I feel like that is just fine. Right. I mean, hybridization would be very good here as it allows him to play Night Veil, Spectre, and hybridization. And so have the God on, too. Right. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I don't, I, I, I'm not a big fan of Jace this turn. I mean, Jace, Jace is interesting because, like, you, you can up it and it turns on Thassa for the yes. necessary devotion, so it's, it's definitely not a bad play for the turn. As Trace checking us how many cards Van Meter has. So it's not a bad turn, but it's just not exciting. Yeah. He's, 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 uh, Trey is opening himself up to a lot of risk with this play. I'm not saying that it's necessarily bad, but he's really leaning on this Frostborn Weird getting to survive because the whole house of cards collapses if it dies. Fassa gets shut off. Jace presumably dies in combat. Uh, there's a lot of pretty bad consequences here. That's assuming that Chris doesn't just kill Trey, which is also uh, potentially on the table as well. Flesh blood, the draw. That's going to change some things. I assume that's really powerful here. Yes. Yes, it is. The blood half being the more powerful of the two. Certainly also the only one that it can cast. Our creature control deals damage equal to its power target creature or player. So he can basically he can kill that Frostburn weird with the blood half. Fire up Mutavolt, get into the red zone with everybody. Thassa won't be able to block, and we're looking to attack for four, or eight, because nine. Jace is Because uh, Jace is uh, min minus ones, everything in combat, he actually might be better off just blooding uh, Jace, dealing five to Jace, because he still has four power attackers that the weird can't block. Okay. So... He's gonna do okay. Sure, he's this gonna is do this. Oh yeah, shock in hand. So I guess this is lethal. Yeah, regardless. shock is lethal. Yeah. So what yeah. you do? Uh, Elvish Mystic act activates Mutavolt because they can't attack. Um, Mutavolt gets in along with the five power elf, which will be a four. Right. Um, Pelucanos is a four. Normally a five, but a four. So that's four, eight, nine. Then shock makes it eleven. Yeah. There's different. W there's a bunch of different ways for Chris to set this all up yeah. there. I, Flesh blood was the check mark though. Yes. That's the card that gets the job done there. Missing Mortars, I think, would have also gotten the job done, but you saw Crisco figure out exactly what I need to do to actually get the job done here. Trigger goes on the stack for the Jace. You've got four from Blue Grinos, four from the Elvish Mystic, one from the Mutavolt. That's nine. Shock makes it 11. Van Cleave's at 10. I'm not a math major, but that's... I'm not a math magician. Yeah, but that's that's the game boys, yeah. as they say. And so that was a really good display, those first two games, of what 
the red green monster deck looks like when it has an accelerant and a good curve versus the games that it doesn't. Yes. I think a very, very nice display as you did mention. So they're even up here between Van Meter and Van Cleave, the Battle of Vans. Mm -hmm. They gotta sell it for once and for all, the loser has to change their name. The winner can continue being called Van Meter or Van Cleave okay. as appropriate. It's a uh, loser leaves town match. Right. I like it. I'm a I'm big like fan. It. Those are my favorite matches. I, I wish you could actually challenge people. There uh, Years ago, I was I was advocating for a change to organized play where you could challenge someone to a retirement match. It would be sanctioned, okay. and the loser would just, that would they would just get a lifetime ban. Okay. So if you no longer, <laughs> and if they decline the challenge, <laughs> If they decline the challenge, that's fine. You just get to brag that you were you challenged them to a retirement match. And they were willing to and, take and it, they, and they would not take. Otherwise, it. loser just perma life banned. I like that. I I could really see that just being an absolutely enjoyable experience. Could you imagine how many people would be on the rail for a retirement match? A ton. Match? A ton. Yeah. The amount of trash talk that would take place. Be insane. Yeah. It'd be really really good. Best of five maybe. Uh. You just want to be stone cold and have it be a one game match. I think the players figure it out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One game match, no mulligans. Yeah, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Got to run it straight. I like it. Yeah. You are out of here for good. Yeah. Kept the no lander, huh? <laughs> Stupid. Should have mulliganed. And then you could you could go to the the suspended players list, and <laughs> you could have reason for suspension, yeah. just retirement, 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 just all the people. Lost to a top deck bolt. Yeah. Yeah, that would be that would yeah. be nice. Missed my second land drop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. This is something we can get. Uh, I think we can get it worked in here. Yeah, I don't know. It didn't sound like the people over in the OP department at Wizards was too amenable to the idea of a retirement uh, match. Got to be a little more open-minded, I think. I think that's the it's key. Not really in the spirit of Magic's organized play, so. But it's in the spirit of competition. Yes, that's true. And maybe that's what I, I think matters the most. It's possible I didn't do a very good job of selling it. Maybe the I think you're doing a great job now. I don't know what your sale tactic was previously. Yeah. But I, I would be buying all the stock in this that I could. Right. I think my sale, my, <laughs> my tactic before was I don't really, I'm not really that interested in playing competitive magic anymore. Okay. There's people I dislike. <laughs> can, can we make this a thing? <laughs> Which maybe again, I, I totally accept that the fault lies with me in the presentation. I'm not saying that anyone else's fault, but I would like to try to get this back on the radar as something to pick up. Well, if uh, Aaron Forsyth and company are watching at home. Uh, you're not a hard guy to find. It's Basic Mountain on Twitter. You want to see the coverage numbers go up? Yeah. You, start, <laughs> you want to see more people tuning in? You have retirement matches. <laughs> loser Leaves Town. So at Basic Mountain uh, for feedback on the Loser how Leaves about, Town. How about, we, how about we just, how about we, you know, compromise a little bit. No lifetime, but it could be a year, 18 months, whatever the case. Okay. Okay. You got to leave town for a little while. Just a short break. Right. You got to take some time off. Maybe a lifetime ban is too extreme. I get, I, I get that. Depends on who you are. Yeah, that's true. Depends on who you are. See, Van Meter is uh gonna gonna look at his opening seven here. Patch <laughs> the old LL team match. <laughs> always, always a great topic of conversation. Yeah. Almost as good as Wesco doing a crossover. <laughs> yeah. See Van Van Meter is going to send a mulligan back. Yeah. Looks like Trey kept four lands, two of them Muta Vaults, a Tie Binder Mage, some of that action, so a little land heavy, but Tie Binder Mage has to be one of Trey's most valuable cards in this matchup. Yeah. Pretty hard to mulligan a hand that has that, two islands, and anything else going on. Yeah, I mean, the hand's perfectly fine. Obviously, the draw steps, you know, he can find a Thassa, a Master of Waves, or what have you, and really just kind of put some things together. But the old with, implied. Him being on the, <laughs> with him being on the play, uh, having a Tide Binder Mage, he can slow down the mana acceleration right. of Van Meter's of Van Meter's deck, uh, and that's exactly where he wants to be, of course. I always like the I always like that the implied ten card hand argument for not mulliganing. It's like, well, Duh. you still have draw steps that could be the best card you can imagine. Have you never run perfect before? Oh, I have, of course. Oh. I'm just, you know, I I always like that when people couch the argument. Yeah, that keep way. the virtual ten. Yeah. Well, I could draw this. I have draw steps, yeah. so it's basically a ten card hand. <laughs> How do you mulligan that? And I know what I'm going to draw. Right. It's going to be Thassa, Master, another Master, yeah. or whatever. Dead. Dead. Scry, sorry, Scryway land, uh, draw Master. Yeah, yeah. That, see, that makes sense because Thassa yeah. controls everything. Right, exactly. So, Van Meter going to lay out six. We'll see what he's able to find. Is he happy, happy? 
He said sure. Yep. Doesn't sound thrilled about it, but good enough as Van Cleuse can leave up an island and pass the turn back here. There is your Elvis and this is why yep, the Tidebinder Mage is going to be at its absolute best right now. Yeah, it doesn't get much better than yeah. this. Shut that Elvish Mystic down, especially when you take a mulligan. There's an Elvish Mystic right off the top, and yeah, Van Meter is in a world of trouble right now. Yeah. Van Cleuse is going to draw a card. It's a Dissolve. Brought in some counter spells. Maybe this is only a thing while he's on the play here, but definitely there's a lot of expensive spells in Chris's deck, and I think uh, making himself a little more durable against Mizzy and Mortars is, is worth having a kind of inefficient counterspell. Yeah, and I think once, especially because he's on the play, he can set up a game state where he is ahead on the board and just has to dissolve uh, at the ready to counter the thing that Chris is trying to catch back up with here. As Van Meter does draw, he land off the top, going to play Sylvan Carrier to attack for a 1-Z with that Elvish Mystic. So at least he'll have access to red mana, which is pretty valuable here. Yes. Good blocker, too. Little scry action here with the god of the sea. We'll see if Van Cleve has found what he's looking for yet. He's going to put that card on the bottom. So we'll take a draw. It's a frostbird weird, so devotion can go to five. Thoughts it can be turned on right now. Yep. Yeah, a lot of different cards in Trey's deck that turns it on right now, so. No third island yet though for Van Cleve. So can't deploy the Night Veil Spectre, which isn't an ace in this matchup anyway. Uh, you could argue that Frostmourne is a better card here, but it looks like he's got other plans in mind. Tapping four mana, maybe a Jace? I like Jace a lot here as it uh, turns Devotion on and develops his board without potentially extending into additional sweepers. Mm -hmm. So, And it's also very, very difficult for uh, Vadmeter to kill right now, too. Mm -hmm. He's so slow out of the gates right now. He's got two one-power creatures and an 0-3. So basically three creatures with no power. It's obviously a very, very good spot for him to be in. If you're Van Cleef, of course. Yes. And Trey deciding whether or not to plus it, even though there's not going to be that much attacking going on, uh, to try to make the Jace as durable as possible, or to minus it right now and try to find some action. I'm trying to figure out exactly how he does want to use that Architect of Thought. Because Trey's hand actually isn't really that good right now. He's got two Frostburn Weirds and a Night Veil Spectre that he can't cast. So uh, there is definitely something attractive about trying to find more stuff to do. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, right? Because it also commits Van Meter's turn to being attacked it with my Elvish Mystic or something of that nature, and you ha I need to have to have like a Gorkland Rampager to get past the Tidebinder Mage, like stuff like that, where it makes it very, very difficult. So it might be worth it just to try to get two cards right now because the likelihood of that Jace dying, it seems like it's pretty low. The biggest problem if he minuses here is probably Xenagos, because that means that Jace either dies or he has to chump block or trade rather with the Tidebinder mm -hmm. Mage, something he's loath to do. So uh, Trey's going to take a slightly more conservative attack than just plus the Jace here. Yeah, I think that's the best word to use, uh, is a more conservative approach here, by just plusing Jace, making sure that it can't die, as Miss Cutter Hydra is going to come off the top here for Van Meter. That's a card that could also have killed it if it did minus, that yep. we didn't even, uh, you know, add into the equation here. Chris does have red mana now with that Sylvan Carrington. He just needs to find uh, ways to use it. He does have a Gorkland Rampager in his hand as well. The problem is that everything that Chris does takes his entire turn. He can't play... He can't really play two spells here. I guess he can play another Sylvan Karyatid and Mortar something, but uh, he's going to be slipping further underneath this Jace and this Thassa. And Chris those are, those are two cards that are so hard to come back from. Yeah, Chris is already at 13. It's not like he can sit around all day and just take these Thassa hits. Five's a lot. It is a lot. It's a lot of damage. All right, so Miss Cutter Hydra is going to come into play. It's a one-power guy. Yep. And this basically, you know, right now Trey is really taxed on blue mana, as we've seen. So this puts him in a spot where if he wants to use Thassa to make it unblockable, which he has to now because the Hydra's in play, mm -hmm. uh, it, it probably comes at the expense of him casting spells. So a little scry action to start things off here for Van Cleve. See if, again, he finds what he's looking for. Trey taking his time here. I'm sure. He has a lot of really attractive draws at this point, and Island is is also really good for him. Yeah, so. he's in the he's obviously in the enviable situation where not only is you know an Island good for him, or most draws are good for him, a land or a spell, but he also gets to control which one he draws. You see an Island added to his hand for the turn. And it wouldn't surprise me to see Trey's turn just be plus Jace, 
Make my thoughts unblockable, hit you, say go with dissolve back up. Yeah, that wouldn't the surprise me one bit. Creatures don't add a lot to the board. He's again, you know, the, the threat of mortars getting overloaded is is now another thing that Trey has to worry about here and uh, it feels like he can just keep clocking. Although it looks like he's tapping two blues, so perhaps he's adding to his board this turn. Well, he's retapping. What is he up to here? He's yeah, just going to make it unblockable? Okay. That's fine. Again, just playing defense with that dissolve in his hand. I would expect him to plus Jace. Just try to make his board as difficult to break up the devotion as possible. He has Chris on a two turn clock here. That's basically what he's accomplishing right now, too. It's just making it almost impossible to get towards Jace and stopping Thassa. And now, of course, Trey could give him more things to the board if he wants to, but he doesn't really feel the need to. But he's going to actually turn, he's going to move down with the Jace. His, his Jace is pretty well protected right now since Chris has not a lot going on. So Funny, that dissolve being turned over there might be either the best or worst possible thing here for Van Cleve in this situation where it's very, it, it's not really something where the, uh, where the mono blue deck has dissolve in their deck. Uh, it's definitely a play style thing, and Dissolve is not the, the standard, especially if you go by a list, you know, like Sam Black plays. Mm -hmm. He doesn't ever play Dissolve. He doesn't have counter spells, except for Gainsay most of the time, maybe negates in the sideboard, whatever. Um, but he's not a player that actually plays Dissolves. Now, if you're Van Cleef, shoot, I reveal Dissolve. So now my opponent knows that I have him in my deck, and th this three mana that I flipped up is pretty clear representation that I have one in my hand. Yeah, this is a pretty, especially now that he's likely to not take the Dissolve pile, it's it's a pretty loud indicator the way he's played this turn, the way he's tapped his mana, all of that, that there's a counter spell looping. Now, it may not actually end up mattering very much because Chris's hand is what he is. He's on a turn, two-turn clock. Mm -hmm. He might not have the luxury of playing around anything. But Yeah, the, just the tough part here is that you know, Trey was try, trying to set a trap with the dissolve that was in his hand, and now it's kind of like the jig is up a little bit here because Jace revealed a dissolve. So now he's just going to take the dissolve and just leave that up still. Yeah. So maybe there's a chance that Van Meter doesn't play around a second dissolve. But also when you're leaving up, when, when Mono Blue is leaving up mana like this, exactly like the way that Trey is, and you know that they have one dissolve in their deck, if, if Trey does that again the following turn, it's like, oh, you have another dissolve. But at the same time, can he beat a second dissolve? Maybe not. Yes. Yeah, it's, it, it seems challenging. Although it looks like Chris has just drawn another copy of Mizium Orders, which allows him to uh, point two removal spells of the Tie Binder Mage this turn. Not so bad. Baby steps. But, you know, Chris does have a lot of backup in his hand to get that, that fast a turn back on. But Yeah. And that's not hard for Trey to do. And for all the creatures that Chris has in play, he can't really pressure that Jace. Yeah. Most of his creatures are lands at this point. He has you know, they look like creatures, but they're actually just tapping for mana. He has four active creatures, total sum of two power. Yeah. Impressive stuff. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. Nice. Yeah. In, a day and age, in this day and age of Pelucranoses and Spirit Mongers and everything else, four creatures, two power. All right. Chris coming out of the tank. Looks like he's coming into a decision. The decision is attack somewhere. We'll figure out if it's going towards Jace or if it's going towards Rosen. I imagine Jace. Yeah, I think, that's I think Chris, now that he kno is aware of the Dissolve, is going to try to use his turn Gore Clan Rampaging instead mm -hmm. because that is not a spell. So it can't be countered. Yep. You can get the Jace off the table. Question is, does he, does he have to attack with both creatures? I guess There's yes. There's a blocking mutable. mutable. Yeah. yeah, that makes it uh, that makes that attack good. Thought there for a moment that he wouldn't need to do that, but yeah, it actually makes it a good attack. He also may want to, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's fine to send the extra creature here, basically. I almost, I, I, I almost think it's just correct to send the extra creature. For a moment, I didn't, but now it, it makes perfect sense. Let's see if Chris wants to uh, use the Gore Clan Rampager. I, I imagine that will be the case. Let's see if Trey does want to do any blocking or not. He's just going to let it go down to one. Okay. It looks like he was trying to induce there, and it didn't work. I'm curious there that... Okay, I guess he's just trying to so fire... Chris is just going to try to fire off two mortars right now. Yep, there's a fire. I think you got to counter this if you're Trey. Yeah, that's... 
because Chris could just say go here, and his turn's been reasonably productive. So, you know, if if you don't use your mana this way, you might not get to use it at all this turn. Yeah. The other thing too is, if he counters this, if he counters this mortars, and then Chris fires off the other mortars to take care of the Tidebinder Mage, Trey can play like a Frostburn Weird. He can find a land with Thassa, play like a Frostburn Weird, and then fire both Mutavolts and attack for lethal. Yeah. So I think you you're almost you almost have to dissolve here, and that's going to resolve. Trey's going to scry. Now there's no guarantee that Chris is going to actually cast this other mortars and maybe wants to have a blocker back. But I think we're in the same situation, right? Because, you know, you make Thassa unblockable, and you fire up two Mutavolts, so you put your opponent down to three, and then you've got Tidebinder, Tidebind, you've got Tidebinder, double Mutavolt attacking. Yeah, so he's going to take care of the Tidebinder mage here, and if Trey's able to find a land, he can play a Frostburn Weird, have Devotion, two from the Jace, two from the Weird, one from the Thassa, and then activate both Mutavolts and make for a lethal attack. Yep. I think that if I was in Chris's spot, I would have preferred just using a Rampager this turn and, and not casting a spell into the Dissolve, leaving as many blockers back as possible. You see Van Cleef immediately put the island into play. So, yeah, if he uh, if he navigates this turn correctly, there's your devotion. Yeah, and Van Meter yeah. immediately concedes the game once he sees Frost when we hit the table. So, Trey Van Cleef is going to win this match over Chris Van Meter, move on to 8-2-1. Van Meter picks up his fourth loss on the week, and he's going to end the tournament at 7-4. Not sure how many open series points he's going to walk.